Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. very compelling evidence that we uh, we may not be alone, whatever that means. Characteristics appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Arrow is the culmination of decades of DOD intelligence community and congressionally directed efforts to successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Disclosure Team with me, your host, Vinnie Adams. The following is an interview with Phoenix, Brandon, another Brandon, Jeff and Grant. They were all stationed at Vandenberg Air Force Base around the early 2000s at the time of multiple UFO UAP incidents, including the Red Square UFO from 2003. Although none of them were direct witnesses to the Red Square UFO, few of them were involved in the incident as security forces, and they also had their own sightings of different UAP during their time on base. If you enjoy this content, please take a second to like the video, subscribe if you don't already, comment and share. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Thank you for watching. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. It's gonna be great to sort of hear your individual accounts about what you all witnessed or heard about at Vandenberg. Uh, so I'd like to go around each person individually and get your name, your position or, or anything like that, the reason why you were at Vandenberg, uh, any duties, just to give an overview of your role, uh, and then we can we can go into kind of what you saw. So, Phoenix, if you don't mind kicking us off, that would be great. Thank you. Of course. Um, my name is Phoenix. Um, I was stationed at Vandenberg Air Force Base from 2002 to 2008. Um, I was a security forces member, and I worked the security side. And so... If you could just sort of tell us about your location uh, and when it was that you had a sighting, if, if, you, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, my sighting happened on base um, in base housing. And Vandenberg's located at, in California on the coast. Okay. And so what, give us a, when, when was this? What year was this? Do you remember? Uh, about 2005. Okay. If you could kind of give us some details about like where you were, what was occurring, and just sort of lay it all out for us. Thank you. All right. Um, we had just had, um, we were at Jeff's house. We had a barbecue and things were winding down. There were just the three of us left, uh, Brandon, Jeff, and myself. Um, we were hanging out in the backyard, uh, just talking. It was pretty late, probably between one or two in the morning. And um, we worked on B-Flight, which was a mid-shift, so we're used to uh, keeping that schedule and just being up all night. So that wasn't um, uncommon. And uh, so we're just sitting in the backyard talking and um, I'm sitting across from Jeff and uh, Brandon's on my right. And um, we're talking and off in the distance, 
um, is when I saw the object object coming towards us. And was this a solid object? Could you see the like the structure? Or what did it actually look like? Oh, that's like the not that none of this is weird or all of it, but that's like the weird thing. Like we couldn't make out what the object looked like. It had a light on it, and we could make out the light. And it was a pulsating light. Um, it would uh, get really bright and then slowly dim out and then disappear and then get really bright and slowly dim out again and disappear. And because of that, like we could track it. It wasn't moving fast. Um, it was moving slow and it was coming towards us. And um, so we're talking and then um, I see it coming and the guys realize I have stopped talking. They're like, are, like, what's wrong? Are you okay? I'm like, are you guys like seeing this? And Jeff turns around and he's like, what the fuck is that? And so we like stand up and we go over and um, yeah, it, it comes right towards us. And we're able to track it through his backyard and then watch it go off in the distance. And did it go off in the same sort of slow speed or did it change uh, speed at all? No. Um, so we were assuming underneath, like I said, we couldn't hear it. Or we couldn't see it. Um, but tracking for as long as we did, um, we assumed that we were under it when we were in, going in the backyard. Um, so it crossed the backyard and then um, the light came back on and it started to go right and the light was on and then it whoosh just darted off really fast and then disappeared. Like I said, we couldn't hear it. Um, we assumed that we would be able to hear it because um, just the way the light was, it seemed like it was low, not super high or anything. Yeah, and I'd imagine that you guys, <clears throat> excuse me, are probably used to seeing like military aircraft, planes, helicopters. So in theory, you, you know, you would have recognized it by sound or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why at first, like, I was like, oh, they're running night operations. I was like, wait a second. Like, why would, like, if it's a spotlight, why is it, like, it just didn't make sense. At first, you're like, oh, yeah, the helicopter. I'm like, well, wait a second. No, not a helicopter. And then when and it, we see missiles and stuff, so we're used to seeing things up in the sky and that we could be like, oh, that's what that is, satellite or helicopter. And did you consider reporting it, uh, that, that, that there was this thing had come over base? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Jeff called the desk, which is like um, our dispatch center, um, and told them what we saw. And then they called the helicopter squadron to see if they were running night operations because they're supposed to notify the desk um, if they're doing that. And then we got a call back saying that they have no idea what we were talking about. Everything was grounded. Nothing should have been up in the air. Wow. And I assume that these things may be captured on some kind of radar system that, that can see things over base. Am I right? Is that something that there should be some data somewhere? I would assume. But I guess that's locked away <laughs> somewhere, maybe. Yeah. I, mean, it... <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, I wish it was when we had like, like now you have phones and you can track it and things like that. But back then they didn't have the technology for that right it was Absolutely. really really interesting but no uh, couldn't make out what it looked like or anything like that just this pulsing light that was with it and again no no sound it was really interesting yeah so was it more just a kind of confusion at the time rather than excitement you know because i know from speaking to a lot of ufo witnesses there's there's a multitude of feelings that people go through so how did you really feel when you were seeing this thing we were just uh, we're trying to figure out what it was. Like so we're cops, we're trained to report the facts, what we see. Yeah. Not embellish, not you know, not trying to sway anyone or anything like that. Just this is what it was. So we're just trying to figure out. Okay, well, if it wasn't a helicopter, like, what, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And ha did you speak to people on base following that? Uh, you know, over the coming days, was it something you talked about openly, or was it more, you know, I want to keep this quiet, just for maybe fear of ridicule or anything like that? Um, not on my end. I didn't really talk to anyone about it just because not because I was afraid of being ridiculed just because I don't know. Nobody seemed to know what it was. So then kind of what's the point, I guess. Yeah. I think there's a lot of disbelief, Yeah, you know, um, yeah. they see this and you second guess everything like, uh, you know, I didn't really see what I thought I saw. I didn't really see this. Um, <laughs> and honestly, what's interesting about kind of our group of friends is that, you know, I think I mentioned it to Porter. I we probably mentioned it to Grant, and then um, this other guy Chaz that we know. You know, who was uh, part of the Vandenberg Square incident too. And so I think it just we have a, we had a very tight, small group of friends 
that we could talk to. And so I think in, in that group, we had talked about it. Um, but again, it's just like, like, really? Is that what you saw? Like, for real? Like, oh, okay. And so, um, and because there's nothing else that ever seemed to come up with these things, you just start yeah. to, to be like, yeah, I didn't really see what I thought I saw. It must have been something else. Right. And have you had any other sightings, Brandon, while you've been on base at all? Um, yeah, for me, I haven't, that was the only sighting on base, um, or that was actually my only sighting, but I was part of the, the night that the call for the Vandenberg square came in, I was on patrol. So I was at Vandenberg from 2001 to 2007. And during that time, um, I, or at least at the time of the incident, I was a patrolman. And so we had different uh, zones on base that we would have to kind of look after, whether it's base housing or it was up into like the LFs and patrolling the coastline. And so just as a kind of a response to if anything were to happen at that in Vandenberg, there was lots of things that like, you know, you get protesters or you get people trying to get on base sometimes. And so they kind of had to spread out that night. I was on main base. And so I actually remember being with uh, the other Brandon and we're sitting at the desk and kind of, <clears throat> you know, with these uh, late at night, again, we worked mids. So I think we were on from six to six is our normal kind of uh, time we're on shift. So about midnight kind of things, we'd kind of go back to the desk and just check in and see how everything was going. If there's anything else that we needed to do. And at that time, that's when the call came in, uh, right about, you know, between like midnight and one. And honestly, I think from my remembrance of what happened was that there was, again, it was like this disbelief, like, are we really hearing what we think we're hearing? You know, that we got people that we know that we've worked with for years in panic mode, calling in this light coming over the ocean and just this, like, what is going on? But again, you know, I think one of those things is being in the military, you, you wouldn't really joke about something on that level. It'd be like one thing if somebody came up to your post and be like, oh yeah, you know, this happened, but to call in in over the, you know, the radio and things like that and be reporting it through that that's an official means it's an official yeah. panel and it has to be it should be reported at least in the blotter and you know official documentations happening and so again uh, we're hearing this report come in and it gets more panicked more panicked and that's when uh, jeff took off to go down there to <laughs> kind of take a look and talk to the people that were uh, posted down there. Uh, the rest of us had to stay because it was primarily, that was our zone to be on main base. But again, at that point then, you know, we're all kind of going out, looking in the sky, like, hey, heading as close to the coast as we can in our zones to see like, hey, are we seeing anything? Is there anything that is kind of still flying over or anything like that? That's interesting. Can you just give us a quick description of how it was described to you? Obviously, you say it was this red object, but just so that I've got it on record, how it how it kind of how you yeah. The call I remember hearing come in was that it was this red glowing object, and it had approached from the the ocean because uh, the way that that site is, it actually sits, I would say, within a hundred yards uh, or two hundred yards of the ocean. It's fairly right. close, and they said it was coming over the ocean directly at. The, comp the space launch complex and then it stopped and it paused over but again all we're getting on the radio at the time is that it's this red glowing object red glowing object over and over and that they don't know what it is that they're you know they're kind of uh you can hear they were freaked out they were very scared at what they were seeing and that it had taken off rather quickly as well yeah no i appreciate that thank you so much um Let's move on to, uh, I'm going to bring Brandon in here because I think, Brandon, you, could you just tell us about your experience? Uh, sorry, first of all, your position and duties uh, at Vandenberg. Sure. So I was stationed at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base between 2000 and 2004. Um, my duties, I was security forces. Um, I was law enforcement uh, side. I patrolled and then ultimately uh, went to the the desk, the dispatcher, desk sergeant. Um, that was That was my position the night of this incident that occurred oh, thank you so much and then sure. so could you give us a description of what you were doing on the night what you heard who you spoke to and, and just kind of lay it out for us yeah sure um thank so you. brandon pretty much summed it up so he he happened to be at the desk at the time that this happened as he said so he came in um and then when this call came in 
uh, we were all kind of like, wait, what's going on here? Um, so my position and my duties was basically to oversee a lot of what was going on and forward all this information up. I was also responsible for the official blotters and all this that happened on any call that got come in or that came in. So uh, when this came in, um, I was like, uh, what do we have going on? First and foremost, we have to get eyes on this guy. We have to get people to the area. We have to start dispatching initial personnel to that area. Um, so when I initially got the call and we heard the tone of the voice, I'm like, you know, something's going on, something serious. Um, there was, I believe, two inter internal starts, two external starts, and then there was like an entry control point. So there was five people already at this um, complex. Um, we had additional patrols that were, you know, security that were di different sites and stuff um, that we were able to dispatch to that location. Um, so that was my initial um, thought was start getting people going to that area. Um, Jeff being the, you know, supervisor of law enforcement side, um, him and I were in contact. He was like, I I'm on my way, I'm going. Um, so I, I maintained contact with the people that are on site, um, just advise them, maintain vigilance, let me know where it's at, um, if it's actually coming to the restricted area, if it's over the restricted area. And as this progressed, they said, you know, this is what this is what it looks like, as Brandon explained before. It's a big red object. There's no sound. Um, it was coming towards the restricted area and they were flat out didn't know what to do. As neither did I, you know, I mean, we're just going based off of training and saying, hey, we're going to send everybody over there and do what we have. And if there's a threat, there's a threat and and, and we handle it from there. Um, so this happened. I don't even know how long I, it's been a long time, um, but it, I, I don't know, maybe 50 seconds, 30 seconds, somewhere in there. It, it, it felt for <laughs> it took a long time. Um, and then they said it just took off you know, up over the mountains and it, and it was gone. So again, that restricted area is right on the ocean. Um, and there's mountains along the coastline of California. So um, we all kind of came back, got together. Uh, we had a debrief about what we all, all seen. And, um, and on my end of things, I had the official reporting responsibilities. So I remember our flight sergeant walking in, our flight chief at the time. And I said, hey, what am I doing with this? Because back in 2000, 2002, 2003, this kind of was like, to me anyways, was hush hush. Um, I'm like, am I putting this in the blotter? And and he says, yes. And I said, OK, you know, just to verify that we're actually going to put this incident on an official document. So um, I typed that all up and off that went. And then I ended up making my um, notifications up the chain to everybody that needed to know that we had an incident that involved a restricted area, which is a big deal. And um we ended up getting off of our shift and then the powers to be above us did what they did with that information. Um, and that's, that's what I had to do with that day. No, oh, thank you. And do you know, or did you speak to any of the, the witnesses that, that were on that, uh, by that restricted area that, that saw the object? Did you have further conversations? As Brandon said, our flight and everybody we worked with, and again, all of us here, um, we all worked together. We were all dear friends. We had a very, very tight group of people. Um, we hung out with each other all the time. Um, we deployed with each other. So we talked about this numerous times over, you know, the, the following weeks and months. Um, and it's funny because when this all came up, uh, Jeff reached out to us and he's like, hey, anybody remember this? And I go, yeah, I do remember this because I literally just told a story and it was probably two weeks prior to him actually reaching out to us about, hey, I was stationed in Vandenberg Air Force Base and we had a big incident out there because it was all starting to come to light and, you know, different people are coming out and speaking about it. So, um, but yeah, we, we did. We, we discussed it. We talked about it. Um, there was several people that were that that observed it that were on that site um, that were en route to that site. Um, and there was also, I believe, prior to our shift coming on. There was another incident that transpired prior to that that um, Jeff was actually briefed about. Mm -hmm. So when he was in, he'll fill you in on that. But, you know, he was already alerted to the fact that there was something going on, whether he believed it, whether he didn't believe it. But when you're also being, you know, told this information from the previous shift, I mean, it's it tends to be probably true, you know. So um, he took that with but he took it with a grain of salt. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. However, we had our incident that occurred and then we're like, holy cow, it, it, it's happening you know so what do we do and you know and then we rolled with it so yeah we talked about this for the course of my career for sure um we all were together for a long time and we're all dear friends and this is kind of cool that we're doing this yeah so jeff obviously you've been on the show before to talk about um you know this bit you know, if you want to add anything to that if you want to kind of you know bring up anything about again what you've experienced even if we've heard it before i'd like to, to hear it again yeah sure um so I, I guess uh, I could start with the I, briefly, 
the Vandenberg Square event. Yeah, I had come in to shift. Uh, I'd come in early to do changeover the day of this event. And I had been briefed on the Red Square incident that had occurred at LF 10 and 20, uh, was it 23, earlier that morning. So I had already gotten the full story from, you know, the, the daytime encounter with the Boeing contractors and, and the gigantic Red Square. And then uh, it, we all came on duty that evening. Um, I'm pretty sure that our flight chief briefed that uh, prior incident in our guard mount. You know, when we begin shift, they give you a briefing on all the incidents that happened uh, previously. So we were all aware that, uh, you know, we had had that encounter earlier that day. And then, uh, yeah, that night, uh, I know we were all, all of us were talking about that incident and excited about it. And I'm sure Brandon uh, was out looking at the sky and Grant was out looking at the sky. <laughs> Um, and we were all out, you know, doing that. And then um, the way I remember it, I had been out on the coast with my NVGs and stuff looking, looking around. And, um, and then I, I got kind of spooked being out there alone. And I came back to the, the dispatch center and I was hanging out with both Brandons on the desk when it happened. Um, and then, yeah, that, that radio transmission came in where they they reported the strange light moving erratically and then you know like brandon said very quickly things got out of hand and uh you know the frantic panicked calls came in with them describing this object coming right up to the entry control point and then flying off and then uh yeah i just remember you know looking or looking at everybody looking at brandon and saying i'm heading out there i'm gonna go and uh and I remember all the radio chatter and, you know, Brandon was com providing command and control, dispatching people, telling people what actions to take. And then when I got out there, I, I talked to everybody that was on scene. Uh, I am pretty sure that I had them take written sworn statements and I would have brought those back to Brandon and turned them in. Um, but they all had seen the same thing. Everybody at slick four, that evening on Bravo flight, they were together at the entry control point when the incident occurred. So they were all standing next to each other and they observed it, it come in, stop, hover silently at the entry control point and then dart off. Um, so I remember pretty clearly all of that happening. And, uh, and yeah, I, I just remember being in complete shock and awe and excited and, and confused yeah and uh and then that kind of leads into grant's story uh, over the next few days strange things kept occurring on the base you know wonderful thank you well let's let's move on to you grant let's uh if you could just quickly again give your position and duties at vanderberg thank you uh i was there from uh i think 2001 to 2000 eight is when I was there and it was already my fourth base. I was security forces. When I got there, I was a staff sergeant, I believe. No, I was a senior when I got there. Um, later when all this happened, I was a staff sergeant, uh, security forces. I was, uh, there as a patrolman, law enforcement patrolman, as well as death sergeant. And then later on game warden there as well. So that's a whole different stories on that side. Yeah, but, yeah. but, <laughs> Uh, the, the thing about all this is the, the stories they're talking about the square and all that. I don't know if it's the same because I was kind of a floater for a while on, on, on different flights because I was a desk sergeant and we were short on desk sergeant. So they had me going from like flight to flight and then, um, stuff like that. So the one incident I do remember well that I did talk to New Satelli about, and I remember well, is the, and I don't know if it's the same one or not, but it is when Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department was calling in into the desk saying, hey, our, our desks, our 911 dispatch is crashed. Like you crashed our 911 dispatch and there's something flying over your base. Can you confirm or blah, 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 blah. And I, 
I remember being on the desk, but I don't think I was working the desk. I think I was just up there watching adults swim or something. And then, and then I remember a bunch of people going out to go look outside and everything. And that's when everybody started talking about it. For some reason, I, I might have been on the desk because I didn't leave. And then I remember uh, writing. I did a blotter entry into it. I mean, I made a detailed blotter entry, so I do remember that. So I had, and I'm pretty sure it's the same incident because weird things happen out there all the time. I mean, all the time. So it was, you don't, you didn't really like just talk about it because it was just like work stuff. So when we were off, we were off. So yeah, we didn't like sit around and talk about it. And plus we were all like Brandon and everybody said we're real close. We were, we were real close. Uh, I'm still haven't been as close. I still don't have friends as close as I am with these guys as I was with those guys. When we were all together. It was, we were tight and we talked about everything and it wasn't that you're being judged. We're afraid to talk about it. It was just, everybody noticed it and seen it. There's nothing really to talk about. I mean, you can't go up with it because they're going to be like, okay, pat you on the head and go on about your way. And you're going to feel like, well, that was now I'm, now I'm an idiot, you know? <laughs> so and, th- and we got those calls a lot up on the desk when I was there. And I got a, I got a lot of calls when I was later on as a game warden out there for strange stuff that happened. Um, I never saw it as a game warden. I would respond, but I never actually, like, put eyes on anything. But And then the night that – and then back to the story of when the, um, the weird thing out on the flight line, I was about to deploy. So I know it was, like, two weeks before Halloween because I deployed on Halloween to Iraq. I remember that. And it was just two weeks before that. So I think it was like the middle of October. I was for some reason, I don't know what I remember being pissed off because I had to sit and I was a staff sergeant, but I had to sit on the North side of the runway for some reason, the base. I don't know what we were doing. I just remember being pissed off and cold and, and lights like they didn't like approach like normal aircraft. They were just there on the flight line and they were on our flight line. It landed on our flight line. I watched it land on our flight line. And I, and it was, I take it was facing me because all I could see was lights and it had zero sound to it. Zero whatsoever sound. And I know the flight line was closed because at that night, I, I mean, everybody knows the flight line's closed out there. After a, we don't have aircraft. And then the second thing, except for helicopters. And the second thing was the tower was, out out because it was dark out there um there was no lights runway lights weren't on none of the lights they usually they would turn on if there's approach of aircraft and it landed i came down i don't know if it landed but it came down it was low and then as fast as it was there it was gone and then we were sitting over there i was with a group of guys and we were all kind of talking about like man i don't know (laughs) are we like losing our you know, losing our minds, man, what's going on? And then uh, that's when uh, uh, someone from the base, it was a colonel, I remember that, and he was like, hey, did you guys see anything out here? And this was like several hours later, asking us about it. And we're like, yeah, we told him what happened. That was the end of it. And then OSI talked about, uh, came and talked about it. Oh, uh, It was like a couple days later or something. Cause I remember starting Owens B said, what do you do now, man? OSBI is, OSBI is looking for you. And if you don't know what OSBI, not OSBI, I'm sorry. OS, uh, what are they called? The Air Force OSBI. office of special investigations. Yeah. The Air Force special. Yeah. Those guys came and, and spoke to us. And, and like I said, I mean, that's all I saw was lights. It disappeared. No sound, no nothing. That was it. And when you say disappeared, did it, fly off disappeared or blink out yeah like it was gone like i mean just gone the wow. lights were there we were looking at them and it was gone like they turned out the lights but you'd be able to see it because it was big it wasn't small it, whatever it was was so it was pretty big that's strange really strange so just kind of coming back to everyone, did anybody hear of anybody saying, well, it must have been helicopters, it must have been this or that? Were there any theories being banded about for any of the sightings? I'll go on this. So from being a desk sergeant like, you know, uh, myself and Grant were, um, anything that's going on around that base is supposed to be called into us. And we're supposed to have notes about what flights are coming in. Because like Grant said, we didn't have planes. And if we had somebody that was landing on those flight lines, 
we had to have people out there. So that was a staffing issue for, for Jeff, you know, Jeff would have to dispatch law enforcement people out to that, uh, to flight line. And we would be, you know, obviously there would be different people that, <laughs> that were supposed to be somewhere else and now have to go to the flight line. So again, you know, we, we had that information that was on the desk. It would be transferred from one desk sergeant to the next desk sergeant for what shift. Um, so we had a pretty good idea of what was going on at that base. And if we didn't know about it, it became an incident and it became an issue and we, and it became a blotter entry, you know? So, yeah. um, and, and we were asked, uh, previous to this too, we had, a we had a weather station on base and they, it would have been above our, our heads, you know? So when we initially had this information and we typed it up and then they went in the blotter and it went wherever it went and people did whatever they did with it that was probably a good place to go to see whether or not, you know, the weather station was marking anything on the radars. Um, you know, so there was, we had capabilities, we had different things going on, um, that could probably figure out what it was or what it wasn't. But as Grant was saying, you know, I mean, we used to get calls all the time from, you know, the sheriff's department, um, Kelfin or highway patrol, they would call us a lot on the desk. Um, him and I would know that obviously, cause we worked the desk quite a bit and, and they would ask us a lot of questions on a, a secure line about what do you guys have going on up there? I'm like, good question. We don't know. So, so as far as that goes, we would have had that information that was going on planes, flying by planes, landing. Um, we needed to know that information. You know, we were, we we're the ones that were going to deal with that. Right. And what sort of aircraft were stationed there? Was it, we were always aware of what was there then what specific models of, you know, whether it's F-18s or I don't, I don't know, whatever it may be. Yeah, we were all trained on our aircraft. That was part of our career field. We had to identify aircraft and know what aircraft are. So, I mean, and like like I said earlier, the only thing that was common there was you might have like a few like F-15s coming in and out. The Navy base might have a few. They'll drop in and maybe do like a touch and go, or they might land and refuel, but that's it. I mean, that's the only aircraft were, were bypassers traveling through. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, we had the seventy-six helicopter test. Well, yeah, or helicopter yeah, yeah. squadron. And those guys, and yeah, and like the Ooh. helicopter, they used, yeah, they used a lot of those for like search and rescue and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, sorry, go on. Oh yeah, because I mean, the whole thing with Vandenberg is that like we didn't have planes on a on any kind of regular basis. I think the only planes I saw primarily were when we had to deploy. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, planes in the deploy. <laughs> And so um, it was primarily the space launch complexes and then the missile defense, the missile defense system is what was there. But I think that's what brings up an interesting, the interesting history of that base and just like what it was originally supposed to be. And the intent was to launch space shuttles off of the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And so and then they did a space shuttle launch. And then after that they realized that the ground erosion was sinking too much. They would not be able to do this over time. So we had one of the longest flight lines in the Air Force. Yeah. I understand. I mean, our flight line was five miles long. Uh, it was huge, and but it was not used. <laughs> so yeah, it, huge. I mean, yeah. we would go out there to do PT or something like that. I'd be like, all right, we're doing the flight line PT uh, this month and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, so I, and then the other thing too, I think is interesting as well is that it, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Vandenberg at that time was the headquarters for Space Command prior to going to Space Force. Or, I believe so, right? Correct, Jeff? Or, no, no, it wasn't. No. It wasn't headquarters. Okay, it was in Colorado. Colorado. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I am incorrect on that. But I mean, ultimately, it was a huge base, um, 43 miles of coastline, and a lot of it was undeveloped. And so, oh, okay. no, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, just like for, for all of the sightings and stories that were about mysterious objects or lights, mm -hmm. you know, having this this helicopter wing, you know, do you think it would have been very easy for any of the witnesses? And this is just your opinion to have known the difference between what they were seeing and a helicopter due to noise, positioning of lights. Let's say they re would recognize that's a, a certain type of helicopter. So, you know, would you think that it, there's a possibility that anyone could have been mistaken for these, seeing helicopters? These were Vietnam era. Uh, okay. Helicopters. So they yeah. were loud. You, yeah. you, there, I mean, you could hear them for miles and miles. Right. And you hear them so often out there. You could tell if they were over the ocean, over land, you could tell the okay. difference in the sound there. Yeah. That's really good. <clears throat> they would also do uh, backup support as well 
for uh, the police and the cops and the security forces out there. So if we had, there were some, there were several instances where we would have um, like a protest coming up and it was going to be a big one in that they would be out flying around as we were also uh, canvassing the, the ground as well. So, I mean, they were, they were out enough that like Rand said, like people would know it, it, yeah. wouldn't, it wasn't some secret. Like we like, Oh, they have a helicopter squadron, but nobody knows about it. It was, it was pretty, they were out quite a bit. And yeah. then, yeah. I was going to say, you know, were there any other instances of any other kinds of incursions over the base that were identified as something prosaic, let's say, or, or were these incident instances the only real ones that happened and you just didn't know what they were? We, we did have um, incursions from the sea, uh, from protesters. They would get Zodiac okay. boats. They would try to infiltrate the base. And we did have a, while I was there, I was there from uh, 1999 until 2006. We had a, a couple of unannounced aircraft arrivals. That that's usually typically if some if a pilot gets lost or has an emergency and needs to find an alternate landing. Um, we had a couple of those, um, but with Grant's case, I do remember basically what. Correct me if I'm wrong, Grant, but what him and the guys he was with observed was a, basically the same thing. They see a strange light over the ocean. It approaches the base. It drops in altitude. They can't make out what it is. It's just this strange light. And then it, it, it literally approaches the flight line, comes down below the tree line. So you're talking below 30 feet. Right. And then, um, and then that light goes out. And I remember it was a, very big deal because it was an unannounced aircraft arrival that's how it was logged and that's one of the most serious uh security incidents you can have you, you can't have unknowns landing on your base right um so i think for that reason is why grant was debriefed um by whoever that colonel was because this was serious business and then by osi later but there should be nothing. I mean, we all know nothing should get into that base undetected because, well, that's the whole base's mission. That's the yeah. function of the base is to make sure nothing comes approaches from the north, west, you know, and mm -hmm. south there. So, yeah. I mean, it's and then I remember someone calling the uh, air traffic controllers on one siding at one time and they didn't even they played dumb. And I don't know if they were playing dumb because that's what they were told to say, but. I don't think I don't think they were high enough rank and I don't think they had any reason to be like to lie. I mean, but I remember them saying I wasn't on the call, but I remember the the call and they all said that they didn't know what it was, you know, like they don't know what they saw. It's an unknown. Yeah, it was just mm. unknown, but that happens so much and you don't really have a reporting agency to go to for that stuff. I mean, they're I mean, that's just I mean, it's you kind of feel like you're in the military. That's your job. You're going to see weird stuff, and that's your job to say hush about it. I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of how we felt back then, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> especially at that base. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you had Boeing contractors and maybe even other contractors as well. Is there any possibility that they could be testing something without the whole base knowing about it? Oh, Would that yeah. be interesting. You yeah. say that because Boeing is one of the people that called that first incident in, I believe. Correct, Joe? Uh, you're right. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Interesting. They, they launch, yeah, they launch big, big things out of there. So, mm -hmm. like payloads for like satellites and stuff. So, I mean, there's all kinds of countries I'm sure linked to it too. Yeah, but I think the main thing too to keep in mind, I mean, if Boeing was going to start testing random stuff without notifying the military, that that becomes a huge security issue in and of itself. That if because of the reaction was that uh, we're going to launch munitions or do something in kind of a reactive way. Now you have the defense contractor coming back in saying what, like that they were the ones in charge of it. And so, I mean, that doesn't really make sense with what their mission was as well, was just to get things into the sky. Get things into the sky. Yeah. And, and the other thing, because that question comes up a lot, do you think, you know, some agency was testing tech? And uh, 
you have to remember that we were heavily armed, right? The Air Force security forces are heavily armed. And depending on where you are in the world, they might have Stinger missiles and, yeah. you know, 50 caliber machine guns. We have grenade launchers. We have grenade machine gun launchers, you know, 40 caliber machine guns. Um, so if, and there, so there would always be a potential if you're testing tech over the base and the cops engage and start to fire at this thing, you're going to have some kind of disaster, right? So yeah, I think it's just highly unlikely that this was some kind of special access program or, or something like that, because, you know, these events happen in broad daylight and they're happening at night. They're happening. They're buzzing, you know, the police who are heavily armed and contractors and, you know, and, the, and it's happening regularly. So, and not just with a military base right there, we had a nuclear plant right there yeah, too. Yeah. Oh, right. Was that separate from the base, but close by? Yeah. Very close. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. it in San Luis Obispo or Pismo or something? It was, yeah, it was somewhere in that area. Cause we worked with some, uh, reservists that worked at the, I can't remember their name, but they worked at the, the new yeah. plant. Cause they all said how good of a job it was and they paid yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. And was that wait, is that nuke plant on the beach, like or by the, right by the ocean? It'd be by the ocean, yeah. That's Not funny because that just jogged a memory. I was in San Luis Obispo in two thousand and five, no, ninety five, nineteen ninety five, and I remember seeing this huge, what would have been a power plant yep. of some sort on the beach. And that's yep, crazy that yeah. I've potentially seen it. Wow, yeah, <laughs> yeah. interesting. Yeah. So you were in that area when Brandon and uh, in Phoenix and I had our encounter. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was 95. Sorry. Oh, I was 95. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I thought I said 05. It was, I thinking back, it was 95. So it's okay. a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. That's crazy. But listen, guys, before, before we end, is there anything else that anyone you think, you know, you want to say or, or anything like that? I don't want to miss anything. Uh, We're all happy. I can't <laughs> think. Yeah. I, I just appreciate the ability to, to have the conversation be more open. I think that is something that I know Jeff and I have talked about for years is just like, again, are we going crazy? Are we remembering things that actually happened? Are we, is our memory and just our understanding of what was happening has that been kind of shifted through time? And so the ability, I think, to take a serious look at this. And I, I know for us, uh, having, a, having that group of friends was easy to not feel crazy. Uh, <laughs> I could not imagine what it would feel like if you were out on patrol by yourself and you didn't have that support system and then trying to process this stuff where you might not have felt like you could have talked. And I, and I know that there's probably a, quite a few military members out there as well that have had that happen. So I think again, just the ability for it to be taken seriously to, to something that can come forward. I, I know I appreciate that. So thank you for that. Oh, no, I appreciate it too. And, you know, I think the, the, the subjects the hold of ufos uap unidentified objects has it's gone mainstream in recent years and you know there isn't so much stigma and taboo surrounding it and you know it's always good to hear from witnesses but then you have credible military trained observers such as you guys coming forward it adds that credibility to it and it's it's not about saying look alien these guys have seen aliens that's nowhere near what we're trying to talk about we're trying to talk about the fact that these incursions have been happening over military installations and you know naval fleets for quite a few decades uh, and these individuals were, were a part of that or who saw things and so that's for me personally is why i really appreciate being able to have this conversation with you gents so thank you thank you thank you one one strange detail i'd like to add uh sure. brandon you could jump in on this too with our encounter so before we saw that light appear before phoenix saw it we were sitting around the fire talking about the previous ufo encounters we were having this like deep discussion the three of us and then phoenix kept you know turning around and then finally i looked up and she's like you know i was like what is that because what we saw was anomalous right it, yeah. and, and i remember us having the conversation like is that a satellite you think it's a satellite and it was it was not moving like a satellite uh because from my recollection it it was maneuvering like gently and then as it came it again it appeared over the ocean got closer and then it dropped in elevation and when it was over my house 
uh, when Phoenix and I talked a while back, she estimated it was about 30 feet in diameter and about 250 feet off the ground. So it was right over us. Yeah. I had estimated it a little bit larger and a little bit higher. I thought it was like about 500 feet. But uh, but that was the weird thing that I couldn't get through my head. Like, we what's what's the odds of a coincidence like that, right? We're we're yeah. having this deep, long conversation about all these events that happened to Grant that that you know Porter, uh, I'm sorry, Brandon saw, and all these other events that we're privy to, and then suddenly it's like, well, here you go, hello, right? <laughs> yeah, Brandon, you want to jump in on that? Do you remember? Well, yeah, I agree. I, you know, I think, um, yeah, my remembrance was three to five hundred feet above. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and again. Vi- like I said, Vandenberg is a very interesting base anyway, because there were lots of other just like weird coincidences, coincidences that would happen. Um, there'd be things that, you know, the, like, you know, don't do this or don't go over here because you might not know what you're going to find type thing. It was and again, there were some things that were almost like these open secrets. Uh, you didn't go out announcing them or talking about them. But during shift change, you'd be like, hey, this happened. You'd just be like, really? Like, OK. And there's like, lots of myths to the base as well like the underground railroads and uh yeah yeah uh, moving, be- nukes, moving nukes under the ground under the base and then man there was a lot of dark history too Patton was lived there too i mean it, and there's a lot of dark history with the um the uh the japanese camps that they oh, had yeah. there. and yeah. then the they're still you, when I was a game warden, we went up to them all the time. We used them as observation posts, but they had the turrets from back in the war when they were going to protect the West Coast. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that you have uh, the Spanish missions are prevalent through Southern California. So there, there was talk of like, you know, um, maybe burial. I mean, burial grounds. There was, there, was, there was a huge mythology, I think, around Vandenberg. Uh, two years, I think it was in 99, they had a huge fire. That, oh yeah, um, the Harris Grade Fire. I was in the middle of that one. I mean, there's, a, yep. you add these things, and then the protests. Uh, Martin Sheen getting arrested at the base, mm-hmm. uh, bringing more light to that. Um, he was a really, he was really nice though. He was very yeah. courteous. He was great, very friendly. But, and, so, and like Grant saying, there we would go out. We would just drive because when you had these patrol zones, they were huge, and so you didn't really have much else to do. So we'd go drive and then you'd be on this dirt road. And then suddenly railroad tracks out of nowhere, bunkers out of nowhere. And it's, it was just a very interesting place to be. Um, and just lots of possibility, I think there, but again, because of that, you know, you don't want to speculate too much on all this stuff. Um, but it just, it led to lots of interesting conversations and debate amongst ourselves about like, Oh, well, what could that be? You know? Yeah. So, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Reagan came out there for the honor of the Reagan space program. Did you guys work that when Nancy Reagan came out? No, I don't remember Reagan that. <laughs> Why do I always get stuck doing that crap? <laughs> <laughs> you guys seem to always get out of that stuff. I was always getting stuck with crap like that. Because you're probably deployed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's probably when you were gone for when you guys Ever. were flying back home and 9-11 happened or not 9-11, yeah 9-11 mm-hmm. happened yeah. 9-11. Yeah. wow well gentlemen listen thank you so much for for your insights for your for your testimony for your stories uh, it really means a lot i really really do appreciate it so thank you thank you, thank you. appreciate thank you, you having us thank you no thank worries you. all right Vinny. <laughs>